go. Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. Now, normally when I do this show, I take the top voted questions, but we have something interesting happening today inside the questions queue. You know how for the past couple of webcasts, I've told you that y'all have really great questions? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes, for reasons that I don't understand, we have a lot of bad questions, and people upvoted them. So I have to apologize in advance, folks. The, the quality of the questions on this one is really bad. Some of you watch like watching me burn people. There will be a lot of burnination, as Trogdor would say, inside of this webcast. Starting with the number one most highly upvoted question from SQL KB. And SQL KB, you shouldn't feel bad. It's not that you're bad. It's just that your question is bad. SQL KB says, according to SP Blitz Cash, I usually have more than, say, 260,000 plans in the cache created in the last hour. Is it a big number? Well, K SQL KB, the reason why you're asking that is SP Blitz Cache told you it was a big number. SP Blitz Cache only warns you about this stuff when we say, hey, you have a high number of cache plans that are single use, that have been uh, uh, repeatedly regenerated because somebody's using uh, unparameterized SQL. There are all kinds of reasons why it's a warning. And next to every warning, there's a URL. Now, I apologize if you're new to technology and you don't know what URL means. URL stands for, you read this, loser. You copy-paste that URL into your web browser, and you read the things that we wrote for you. Now, I apologize. I wish that our scripts would hand deliver you every piece of knowledge that you need spoken in the clear, friendly language of your choice, not condescending the way that my webcasts often are. But suck it up and do the work. Read it. That's the reason why we give you those warnings. So read them. Golly. Next up on the uh, wall of shame, Chase asks, what do the options under linked server provider settings mean? Well, if you want to go through and click randomly on different buttons, oh, what does this button do? You're probably not going to have a great career in databases. There are a lot of buttons. And if you're not smart enough to read the documentation, like our last friend SQL KB, you're going to have a bad time randomly pushing buttons when you're not necessarily even having problems to begin with. This person saying a lot of these are frustrating, ungoogleable. Why are you trying to touch them then? If you can't find information about a button, why are you like a six-year-old walking around trying to touch appliances? This is the system that your business relies on. Get your peanut butter covered fingers out of there. I would further say that you shouldn't be using linked servers anyway. Go connect to the server that has the data that you want. You wouldn't go ask a friend, hey, can you go check over to that other database server and then check other to another database server and maybe they have the data. Just go get with the database server that you want. That's how you write fast queries. There is no magic button that you're missing under linked servers that's going to turn linked server queries hella fast. It's not like there's magic there. Go connect to the server that has the data that you want. That isn't rocket science. Select Ram asks, you mentioned the PLE is useless recently. No. I used to work for Quest Software back in, I want to say around 2006, 2007, 2008, somewhere in there. And we were saying it back then. We put out posters talking about all the different perfmon counters that were totally terrible. We called them the red herring performance counters. I've been saying it for over a decade. You just recently started listening 
So what this typically means, select RAM, what it typically means is that somebody has been uh, working with SQL Server for like 20 years, which you would think would be a good thing. But unfortunately, they did their learning 20 years ago, and they've never been to a training class since. They've never read an updated book. Uh, they've never uh, looked at updated blog posts, whatever. Page life expectancy has been hot garbage for like 15 years. What you can do in order to figure out how to measure SQL servers is check out my Mastering Server Tuning class, where how to measure SQL servers is like the very first module that we cover. Uh, next up, call me Ishmael, which is a great way to start a question too as well. Call me Ishmael asks a really good question. This, this is not a bad question at all, but I think Microsoft's reasons for doing it are bad. Call me Ishmael says, will SQL Server ever mandate the semicolon as a statement terminator? Long time ago, Microsoft deprecated T-SQL statements that don't end in a semicolon. Oh my gosh, this again was like 15, 16 years ago. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why when you begin a CTE, if you start with, if you say with whatever, you name common table expressions, it, you, it had the previous statement has to finish with a semicolon. So what you see a lot of people doing is they start their uh, CTE queries with a semicolon just to make sure that the previous one is terminated. At the time that they did that, you would hear Microsoft employees saying, well, you know, it's really holding us back not being able to put semicolons and guarantee that every statement finishes with a semicolon. We could do amazing things if we didn't. I'm like, really? Is that what's holding you back? That? You're stopping you from fixing problems is the semicolon? Really? Well, it sure would make our life easier. Yeah, okay. So they made noise like they were going to say in some future version, every T-SQL statement has to end with a semicolon or else it won't compile. That will never happen. Because as soon as they try to do that, every application out there will break. And so what will happen is, is no one will want to go to the SQL Server version that requires semicolons. Managers would be like, what do you, this, the new version? All my apps are going to break? And you're telling me i got to go back through all my code and just put in stupid semicolons in order to go to this new version of SQL Server? Oh, sure, I'll get right on that. Uh, never. So it's never going to happen because Microsoft only gets paid when you keep moving to newer versions of SQL Server and keep everything covered under software assurance. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Next up in our stupid questions uh, tour, Mike asks, what do you think about running SQL Server in Kubernetes for production workloads in the year 2023? I think it's dumb as a stump. I think it's absolutely idiotic. It makes your troubleshooting harder. It makes your uh, builds weirder. It makes it harder to hire people who understand how that stuff works. It breaks the hell out of quick, high availability and disaster recovery. And when Kubernetes people hear that, they're like, wait, no, but it's high availability is handled by the Kubernetes layer. Yeah, but it takes forever to spin up a brand new container uh, that runs SQL Server. The, 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 usually for high availability, people want failover in less than six. 60 seconds. And it's hard to do fail, failure detection and spinning up a new container uh, inside the span of 60 seconds, given how large SQL Server uh, tends to be. Uh, I, I, if you wanted to do it for development, it makes perfect sense. I Perfect sense? I don't think you really need Kubernetes for that. I think if you wanted to containers, you could just do Docker containers. But I, I, I don't see the point of that. Microsoft, back in 2017, had said that they were going to support always-on availability groups in Kubernetes, and they even had to backtrack that like six years ago. They Right as we were, they were getting ready to ship, they were like, actually, we're not going to do that because it turns out to be harder than we thought, and they haven't introduced it in any version since, which kind of tells you something. Uh, next up, Yitzhak asks, this is a good question, but I usually have to give this answer when I'm dealing with stupid uh, questions. Yitzhak asks, you once used a nice analogy in relating uh, pilots to airplanes and DBAs to SQL servers. Can you tell it again? Modern airplanes are so advanced that they practically fly themselves. 
in some modern airplanes, like the Cirrus, I want to say it's an SR-22, um, in the event of an emergency, you can push a button and it will automatically, like if the pilot becomes unconscious, you can push a button. The plane will communicate to ATC, the air traffic control, that it's in trouble, find the nearest airport, and land the plane with no human intervention. It's pretty freaking awesome. So modern airplane pilots like to joke that modern airplanes are so advanced that you just have two things in the cockpit. There's the pilot and there's the dog. The pilot's job is to feed the dog. The dog's job is to bite the pilot if he tries to touch anything. SQL Server needs a dog because we have so many people like we've seen in the previous questions, that are like, what does this button do? I wonder what that dial means. I bet if I push here, that dial will go up. People who have no formal education, who are wildly clicking around in all kinds of options, doing things that they don't understand. I wish that SQL Server would give a little bit more of a barrier when people go trying to click around randomly and touch things. And then let's see here, we'll do one more uh, stupid question, and I'm sure there are more in the queue, but one more stupid question. When moving large tables to a new file group, does it ever make sense to do the migration with BCP via command line versus using T-SQL? So BCP pulls the data out of the database and then pushes it back in. Really? You think it's going to be faster to take data out of SQL Server and then bring it back in as opposed to just doing it all in SQL Server's memory space for that particular task? Also, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that so often that you need to performance tune it and why didn't you just try it? If you have a hypothesis that something's going to be faster, it's not on someone else to prove that your dumb idea is going to go well. If you're the one with the dumb idea, buckle up, strap on your parachute, and you be the one that wastes people's time and your own bodily you know, safety in order to prove that your dumb idea is going to work well. Don't put it on other people, even if it seems like my time is free. Come to me with real problems, not, hey, would it be cooler if I strapped a duck to the side of the SQL server? No, of course it wouldn't. Don't be ridiculous. And that, ladies and gentlemen, ends up our unusual bad ideas office hours. And isn't it kind of funny how usually I'll go through and I'll prune the queue uh, and make sure that the dumb questions are kind of out of there. But I thought it was kind of fun to go through because there were so many bad ones inside this. Oh, also, I totally need a haircut today. Next time that you see another office hours, I'll probably have a different haircut. And, uh, either that or I'll be wearing a hat, one of the two. So thanks, everybody, for hanging out with me. And I will see you all on the next office hours. Adios.